Hi, this is Steven Seiler. Uh, I'm sitting in my office and I'm analyzing some data. And I want to just show you a little uh, things I'm thinking about because I'm trying to figure out some issues related to high intensity repeatability, how it all fits in with, for example, the critical power W prime concept, uh, anaerobic versus aerobic energy. So there's, there's some issues that, that all kind of converge. And so uh, I'll show you where I'm at uh, with a few things. And, and this is just a kind of a free flowing discussion, but I'm using some tools to try to get at it. And, and then you can send comments for on what you think. So let me go to the screen. Um, now you should see a power duration curve. This is basically my power duration curve. Um, the power duration curve was first described over a hundred years ago by A.V. Hill, uh, and it forms the basis for a lot of discussion on uh, aerobic versus anaerobic energy release. Base it forms the basis for the um, the critical power concept that was first described by Monod and Shear back in 1965. That was the year I was born, so that's a 55 year old. Uh, concept A.V. Hill presented over a hundred years ago, or about a hundred years ago, uh, and since Modon and Shear's introduction of critical power, there's been a lot of studies on it, a lot of kind of slow adaptations and constrictions, you might say, or constraints of the original idea that the critical power was some power that was sustainable indefinitely or a very long time. Uh, now we know that that's really not the case. Um, and it is also shown that you can convert the critical power or, or um, excuse me, the power duration curve into a linearization using work performed and work duration. And you can make some estimates of critical power and this, this y-intercept, which is defined as now defined as W prime. Many years ago, it was defined as the anaerobic work capacity, but now we feel comfortable saying, well, that's not quite true. It's not just anaerobic, but it's above this critical power value. Uh, so what I'm showing you now is a little calculator that uh, John Peters and I put together that allows you to kind of play with your power duration curve uh, and play with how it's impacted by, or the critical power calculation is impacted by the numbers you put in and which durations you use. The current literature basically says that if you're going to get a valid critical power measurement, you, you need to use tests between uh, two minutes, three minutes, and say 20 minutes. Uh, so that's the window of validity, you might say, for critical power as a, as a predictor of power versus duration. When you go beyond that to longer power, such as 60 minutes, or when you go to very short durations, then the critical power model begins to kind of degrade because of some realities that aren't really, that are true in reality, but don't reflect or are not reflected by the critical power uh, model uh, because it assumes an asymptotic relationship, whereas actually there is a continuous decay and there's not an infinite peak power. There is some peak power. So both of those uh, are problematic at the extremes if you use them. So if I take, for example, my 60 minute power, now these values are legit. These are real. This was, I'm going to show you this. I just tested a few days ago. This was from a week ago. Uh, these, this is, you know, within the last few weeks. So uh, these are solid numbers. And if I add them to the calculations, for example, here I add that extra value 60 minute power the correlation is really good but it dramatically changes the calculated 
uh, critical power if I add that longer workload. It, it dramatically reduces the estimate of critical power and dramatically increases the estimate of W prime versus when I just use the window that is suggested, uh, which is this, you know, three to 20 minute. Here I'm using uh, these values. I'm using three minutes, six minutes, and 20 minutes. So what exactly within the prescribed window by those who do research on critical power. Okay, so the, the values that I get then are about 321 watts and 21.6 kilojoules for the W prime. So now I'm gonna go a step further and I've created this little calculator where I've taken those values and put them in, and then I have created a kind of a chart of different segments or uh, fractions of total W prime, 10% of W prime, 15%, and then looked at how many seconds would I hold this power uh, to get this fraction of W prime. So, 1.25 times my critical power gives me 402 watts uh, calculated. 10% of that would be used up if I worked for 26 seconds at that power. So that's, and that's very tolerable. That's, that's the kind of thing that happens during these stochastic races where you're kind of going up and down a bit is you get these small surges uh, if I go on the other end here, if I popped up to 900 watts and held it for three seconds, that would give the same, uh, the same amount of W prime utilization. So these are equivalencies across rows. And then as you go down, these are farther and farther towards using what is, would be assumed to be 100% of the calculated W prime. Now, According to this calculation, then at 400 watts, 402 watts, I could hold that for about four minutes, a little bit longer, four minutes and 17 seconds. So, uh, so I'm going to play with this a little bit because I know, just because I just tested it, that my six minute power is 393 watts. So I fudged this to give me that value. And it says that based on a W prime of 20.7 kilojoules, I should be able to hold 393 watts for 290 seconds. That's four minutes and 50 seconds. Well, I can actually hold it for six minutes. So something's not quite fitting here. All right. So what I want to do is then uh, go back I'm going to go to the actual test that I did, uh, which I've placed here. I did a two hour ride, but in that two hour ride, I did one, I did a decent warm up here, and then I did an actual six minute test. Okay, so here is the actual six minute test. I have gone in and created these um, segments uh, using uh, this spoke you know gone in and counted seconds to, to get the laps so that I've isolated that uh, from it you can see what it looks like here when I do such so here's the actual six minute test hovering around 400 watts a uh, little bit of dips up and above and then when you take the average for the six minutes it was 393 watts and here was something important it the actual work above 321 watts, which is that critical power, was 26 kilojoules, not 21. So something's not quite fitting, uh, but that's what I actually did. OK, so now if we go back to the critical power calculator and now I'm going to change this to 26. And then what do you get? Ah, lo and behold, it predicts that I should be able to hold that power 364 seconds. That's six minutes and four seconds. So, so, so now everything, everything comes together. This fits uh, f with this six minute duration. 
okay and that's kind of right in the middle of the w, of the window of validity uh, for the critical power model now what happens though is if i go out and look at estimations of segments these are equivalents so this i can do this 40 seconds at 965 watts i can most assure you i cannot do not even close 965 i can maybe hold for it's around 10 seconds that i can hold that 8 9 10 11 it's in that range that i could hold that and that would be an all out effort it wouldn't be a uh, easy such we, uh, an easy uh, workload for me so what i'm showing here this is kind of my estimation without having tested all of these this is this is physiological i can do this this is approaching limit and this is not physiological i couldn't actually achieve those so not all combinations of power and duration that are within the w prime uh, value are actually physiologically achievable uh, and so you might say these are clearly rates of glycolysis or rates of glycolytic flux that just overwhelm the muscle and lead to uh, acute failure or acute fatigue and a failure to maintain that power uh, so I, this is kind of interesting because the reason I even made this in the first place was the reality that during these stochastic races, uh, these highly variable like a criterium race or so forth, or a cross-country skiing race where you're going up and down hills, we see that the performers do a lot of this where they are surging for very brief periods, seconds, and then recovering. And maybe a, a long push might be a, a minute or 30 seconds. Um, so I'll show you what that looks like if we go back and now i'm going to go uh to another well i was hoping i would i was hoping i would avoid that but the automatic timeout hit me so i'm gonna you're gonna have to struggle with me or actually i'll just go here and i will find a different i'll find a different um file so I'm going to find a different file where I have done a race and that is here, oops, here. And I'm going to load that. And now you're going to see a, a 20 minute race. And I've broken the 20 minute race up into two minute sections. So this is the, the race itself. Um, the average power for this race was, um, I can get that for you. The average power was, watch this, race. This is what I had already done, but now I'm going to do it again on the fly. So I'm just going to combine all of those so that it provides us with the average power for the entire 20 minute race. And this is the, um, the w prime the work above red line which in this case is defined as that 320 watt critical power estimation so i generated 34 kilojoules of w prime which is whether it's really 21 or 26 kilojoules either way it's above the clearly above the calculated uh, amount of work that i should be able to achieve during a constant load effort to failure that means there is some recovery of W prime, a recovery of anaerobic or, or this high intensity uh, capacity during the race. Um, and then there's a big surge at the end. And this is kind of, this is what racing looks like. Now I, I wanna just point out at the end here that, um, you know, to, to win a race like this, and this is a Zwift race, you need a sprint at the end because you won't be able to get away. The sprint I was able to muster was only 818 watts peak. Uh, but the reality is, is that's not that terrible because most of the athletes don't get re their true peak power at the end of such a high intensity effort because they are partially fatigued and so even after just four minutes of recovery post-race 
quite a bit, of, you know, a few seconds at zero power and then up to about 200 watts. Then I popped a sprint and, and I hit, um, actually, I think I went a little bit above a thousand watts. So in just four minutes of recovery, I'm actually going about 20% plus better peak power. Uh, and that clearly shows that there's some partial fatigue. And so you really don't have your peak power available to you at the end of a race because you are carrying a lot of fatigue into it. And obviously, as one way to improve is to try to be able to avoid using very much, you know, W prime, as we might say, during that decisive period. And another, of course, would be to somehow improve that ability to uh, mobilize at the end. So that's what I wanted to show you here. And if we go back to the, uh, the model this predicts, uh, this is kind of consistent with that, that these periods are physiologically achievable, uh, but these are not, even though they are ISO energetic in terms of they are different ways of achieving the same amount of uh, work above the critical power. So just because it's mathematically consistent doesn't mean it's physiologically uh, achievable. So that's where I'll quit now for, uh, but I'll just, I think I'll do one more thing and that is I will take this and I'll show you something else. Whoops. Bear with me here. So there, I just want to show you that if you take the calculations from this actual six minute test that I did, where I achieved 393 watts for 363 seconds, I convert that to the actual kilojoules of work that were performed in six minutes, and then say, well, what fraction of that was explained by W prime, which was 26 kilojoules, you get 18.4%. And that coincides really well with our typical uh, or another approach to calculating anaerobic versus aerobic energy. And that is uh, the maximum accumulated oxygen deficit approach. And generally when you do that, you, you, what you get is oxygen equivalence. And you get, for most well-trained athletes, you get approximately the equivalent of one minute at VO2 max, about somewhere around 70 milliliters of oxygen equivalents per kilogram W prime or anaerobic energy. And so one minute out of six is roughly 17%. So it's a pretty close estimation. That's pretty typical for the percentage of anaerobic contribution to an all out test lasting six minutes. Uh, so, so that's kind of interesting that these do, these two methodologies do coincide reasonably well, at least within that time frame. All right, I'll quit there.